Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, right after the end of the spring semester and in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since we do not yet know for sure what format our classes will take in the fall, and since there's some likelihood that at least some of us, both students and faculty, will have to be away from campus for a time should the mitigation plans prove ineffective or should compliance with or enforcement of public health guidelines prove impossible, I am preparing a video version of each of my lectures for the class to have it ready if and when it is needed. It's also the case that necessary distancing requirements in the classrooms may make it impossible that the entire class can be in the same room at the same time. In that case, those whose turn it is to stay away from campus may find these video lectures a better option than relying on a live classroom feed via Zoom or some other technology. So if you're watching this video, it means that we are, for reasons of public and personal health, still unable to meet together in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom format. All the same, I'll continue to do my best to teach you what I know with whatever tools I have at my disposal. Enjoy the lecture. So in this presentation, I want to talk about the second of your writing assignments, which is the value argument. So your second writing assignment is going to be a value argument brief. And remember that a brief is a detailed outline that shows the structure of your reasoning and in this case, it shows your reasoning in support of a value claim. You'll find detailed instructions for the assignment on Canvas. And you'll also find there the list of 50 value propositions. You'll need to select one from that list of 50. Uh, no two students may do the same proposition, so you may not select a proposition that's already been selected. So each individual student has their own proposition. And then once you select a proposition, you then need to select a value object to fill in the blank, that is to complete the proposition. So you have a full statement that serves as the claim to which your whole value argument goes in support. So for example, if you look down the list of propositions here, you'll see uh, for, for instance, number 13, the best beer ever brewed is, and you can complete that sentence, that claim, by filling in any value object from the category of beers. You could fill in Bud Light, you could fill in Shipyard IPA, you could fill in Guinness, whatever is your selection for the value object that completes the claim, you can select you have now your completed proposition and it becomes the conclusion or uh, ultimate proposition of your value argument. So a value argument is an argument made in support of a value claim. And recall that a value claim is a statement that advances an opinion or a judgment about the worth or the value of something. It claims that the value object about which it makes the claim is good, better, right, just, beautiful, sinful, effective, legal, horrible, ethical, justifiable, worse. And if you go back and look at that list of propositions, you'll find that many of them contain one of those kinds of adjectives, the best, the funniest, the most beautiful, the worst, that kind of thing, because each of them is a value proposition. So for your value uh, argument, you will choose the particular value proposition from the list, and you'll complete the proposition by filling in a value object of your choice selected from the category to which the proposition refers. So if it is about the best film ever made, you pick the film. It's from the category of films. You select the one value object that is the one film that you consider the best. The same would be true for novels, for restaurants, uh, for poems, for museums, for universities. It's the category from which you select the value object that is the unique item that you choose to fill in the blank and complete 
a proposition. And then you'll construct an argument in support of that completed value proposition. And your argument must address the stock issues for a value argument. And I'll explain what stock issues are here in a moment. But what this means is that everybody, regardless of the particular proposition that you choose and regardless of the specific value object you use to complete the proposition, everybody will have the same four major parts for their writing assignment because each of you will be addressing the same four stock issues for a value argument. So what are stock issues? Recall first that an issue is a point of controversy in a debate. It's a place where two sides in the debate disagree about something. And when they disagree, that's, of course, where we expect there to be argument, where we expect each side to offer reasons, evidence, and proof in support of the claims that they are making and which uh, contradict one another or which disagree. Right? So when an arguer advances a value proposition, we expect certain essential issues to arise. And this is what we call the stock issues. That is, these are the standard points of controversy in a debate over a value claim, right? So if somebody's arguing about, you know, who's the greatest basketball player ever, we would expect there to be not just, I think it's Michael Jordan, I think it's Bill Russell, I think it's Magic Johnson, I think it's Larry Bird, but we would have also different points of issue which occur in the course of that debate. We would talk about, for instance, the perspectives from which to judge the greatest basketball player. We would talk about the criteria with which we would judge the greatest basketball player. And each of these forms a potential point of controversy or issue in the debate. And so the stock issues then are the standard or expected points of controversy in uh, a value argument debate. So the ordinary issues that must be engaged in any value argument are known as the stock issues. And everybody's value argument then is going to address the four stock issues for value arguments. So what are those stock issues? The stock issues in a value argument are first of all definition, then perspective, then criteria, then application. And these are described in detail in the written instructions and I'm going to talk about each one of them individually here as well. But basically this is the uh, large form outline for everybody's paper. That is, everybody will have a section dealing with the stock issue of definition. Everyone will have a section dealing with perspective. Everyone will have a section dealing with criteria. And everyone will also have an application section because these are the stock issues for a value argument. So let's review these individually. The first one is definition. So in the definition section, you are identifying the key terms in your argument and you're offering clear definitions of them and of any other term about which there might be some disagreement. And by definition, I mean sort of common sense definition. You don't have to go and quote an authoritative source. You can do that if you want. But mainly the, the, the object here is to arrive at a definition that we can agree with before moving on in the argument so that we're clear as we begin the argument what the meaning of all the terms in the argument are. So the point of addressing the first stock issue clearly is to establish that agreed upon starting point for the rest of the argument. What do you mean by each of the key terms in your proposition? Because if we do not understand or begin with an agreement about the meaning of the key terms and the logical categories those terms represent, then we cannot proceed to argue about propositions consisting of those terms. So if I want to say something about 
the greatest restaurant in America, okay? Well, I would want to first define what restaurant means. Do I mean a place where we, where we go in and sit down and dine, or could it also include sort of drive-through establishments like McDonald's or something, right? And so to avoid any possible point of ambiguity or confusion, right, we want to clearly define each of the key terms in the proposition that makes up the basis for our value argument. So we begin by addressing the stock issue of definition. So here's an example. Suppose I'm making um, a value argument about the greatest college mascot. So this doesn't appear on your list, but if it did, it would say the greatest college mascot is, and then there would be a blank space, right? And so I would need to choose um, a value object. And as an alumnus of the University of Wisconsin, I would obviously choose Bucky Badger. So suppose then that my completed proposition is the University of Wisconsin's Bucky Badger is the greatest college mascot. That's my value claim. That's my value proposition. And the rest of my argument brief would be directed toward establishing the truth of that claim. Okay. So I begin with that stock issue of definition. I have to begin by defining all of the key terms in my proposition. So what do I mean when I say the University of Wisconsin? Just to be sure we agree that I'm referring only to the main campus in Madison and not, for instance, some of the regional campuses such as those at Stevens Point or Eau Claire or Superior or some other town in Wisconsin. And then I want to explain who Bucky Badger is, giving some background, some history, some facts about his origin, um, where uh, people at the university are likely to encounter him at the football games, at the ice hockey games, at the basketball games, and at other events on campus, right? So just so everybody is clear who it is or what it is we're talking about when we refer to Bucky Badger. And then I want to clearly define the category from which my value object has been selected. And in this case, the category is college mascots. So what do we mean when we talk about a college mascot? And in, in my argument, uh, in that definition section, I would be sure that, to, that everyone understands we're referring to four-year colleges and to those fictional or iconic characters who serve as representatives of the college and whose main function is to encourage the success of athletic teams and to entertain fans at college games. Now, this, some of this may seem like common sense, but we do it anyway. We go through the exercise of defining the key terms because the, the first step in any argument is to, is to have an understanding about each of the terms in any major proposition. If you lack that understanding, if terms remain ambiguous, you can't proceed to judge propositions, the truth or falsity of propositions uh, of which those terms uh, consist. So the second um, of the stock issues is the perspective issue. And in addressing this second stock issue of perspective, here you're offering an argument in favor of approaching your particular value judgment from a given disciplinary or professional perspective or field. So you consider the perspectives, the relevant perspectives, which provide you with the solid grounds for supporting your claim. And you can sh should consider how others in your audience would be likely to approach the same kind of judgment. So if your category is um, the best novel ever written, well, how do most people usually judge one novel from another, right? So consider the perspectives that members of your audience would take for making the same kind of judgment. And here's the key thing. The perspective that you select, or the perspectives, because you'll want to have more than one, 
the perspective is, must be able to be applied to any judgment of the sort you are making, not merely to the particular value object you have chosen. So the key thing in uh, choosing perspectives is to select one that uh, allows you to avoid making a circular argument, okay? You want to have a fair uh, and objective assessment of the various possible nominees from the category, which could be selected as the value object. So you have to have perspectives which can be applied fairly to any of the objects in the category. Um, so when we're thinking about, when you're thinking about choosing a perspective, choose perspectives that first of all would make sense to your audience. That is that they would be perspectives members of your audience would likely choose as well. And also be sure that whatever perspective you select it could be applied not just to your chosen value object, but to any object in the category. So for instance, suppose my argument is about the best candy bar. There are different perspectives from which you could judge a candy bar. You could, for instance, talk about it from, um, let's say, a confectionery perspective. That is, how is the candy bar made? What are its ingredients? How does it taste, right? And that could be applied equally to a Hershey bar, to a Nestle's Crunch, to a Baby Ruth, uh, and to any other candy bar in the category. You also might choose, a, let's say, a judgment about this from a business perspective. That is, how are the candy bars marketed or advertised, or which candy bar produces the most profit for the candy companies, right? And again, that perspective can't be applied just to the one candy bar that you've selected, but it would have to be applicable to any candy bar or any object in the category. And that's what allows you to avoid the circular argument. So let's go back to our example of mascots. What would be the perspectives, for instance, from which we would judge or from which most people in our audience would be likely to judge college mascots? How would they consider this from different perspectives? So we would say it probably makes sense to most people to judge the best mascot, first of all, from an athletic perspective because this would permit us to consider matters related to the success of the mascot in promoting sports at a given college. Again, notice I'm not talking just about Bucky Badger here, but I'm talking about any mascot at any college. This perspective, it should make sense to apply this perspective to any object in the category. So you could be talking about Bucky Badger, but you could also be talking about any other mascot at any other college or university. And so it should make sense to members of your audience that to judge within the category of mascots, it makes sense to take an athletic perspective as one of the perspectives that you use to make that judgment. And your objective here would be to explain not only what the benefits of that perspective are, but in a sense to justify and rationalize why that perspective is useful. And this is especially important if you happen to select a perspective that may be unusual or which perhaps is something that most members of your audience wouldn't initially think of. So your objective in this section is not only to identify the perspective and to explain what benefits um, accrue from using that perspective, but to also explain and justify why that makes sense as a perspective for a value judgment of this sort. We could also, for instance, consider college mascots from a commercial perspective. We can see, first of all, this clearly implies a different way of judging or thinking about college mascots from the already chosen athletic perspective, because in this case, a commercial, uh, commercial perspective would permit us to consider matters related to the marketing of licensed products, maybe with the image, uh, the trademarked image of the mascot, right? The value of that mascot icon or trademark 
in economic terms, clearly different than the kinds of things you would consider from an athletic perspective. You could also consider college mascots from a philanthropic perspective, right? And that perspective would permit us to consider matters related to the charitable activities of the mascot and the role of the mascot in the wider community. Does the mascot, for instance, go to elementary school events? Does the mascot uh, visit sick children in hospitals? Does the mascot help out for community fundraisers for important causes and that kind of thing, right? So lots of college mascots do that. It's not something unique to my value object, Bucky Badger, but we could say, and I think most people in the audience would say, yes, this perspective allows us to consider questions that are not available under the commercial perspective or under the athletic perspective, and so gives us another source of available arguments to use in support of the overall value claim or the value proposition, uh, which is the point of the argument. So then the third stock issue is that of criteria. So once you have selected your perspectives, you're now looking for specific standards or criteria to apply in judging between your value object and the other objects in the category. So in addressing the stock issue of criteria, you're advancing an argument which defends, explains, and justifies the specific standards according to which one could reasonably judge any object or any item in the category of your value object. So here what we're doing is based on the perspectives that we've identified, we're now selecting specific criteria or standards that can be applied. So, that it, so there's a close relationship between the criteria that you use and the perspectives that you've selected. That is, the criteria should be generated out of the different perspectives. You should not be introducing criteria here which are not connected to one of the perspectives that you've already identified. So the criteria then are directly related to the perspectives that you've chosen, and again, note that like the perspectives that you've chosen, the criteria must be useful in any judgment about value objects of the sort you're focused on. So they have to be criteria or standards that are applicable to any item or any object in the category. So again, let's go back to the example of restaurants. You couldn't say as a criterion the best restaurant in the world must have golden arches, right? Because that only applies to McDonald's. And so it's unfair. It eliminates every other restaurant in the world. It creates what we call a circular argument fallacy. And so you have to choose perspectives which can be fairly and objectively applied to any of the objects in the category of restaurants or mascots or novels or films or whatever the category is that you're working within. And there must be then at least one criterion for each of the perspectives that you've identified, right? So if you've identified three perspectives, you'll probably end up with somewhere close to eight or ten criteria, but at least one criterion must come from each one of the perspectives that you've chosen and presented in the previous section. So now we move on to the example again and in the third section related to criteria we would identify the specific criteria or standards by which um, the greatest college mascot ought to be judged. And again, you're thinking about criteria in terms of what would your audience think are the reasonable or expected questions or um, standards that would be applied for making this kind of a judgment. So always select your criteria with your audience in mind. Will they consider this to be a reasonable criterion to apply? So we would say, for instance, 
to judge the greatest college mascot, one determines whether any value object meets these reasonable criteria related to the perspectives already chosen. So the mascot must represent a successful sports program might be a criterion that we would apply, right? The mascot must be a recognizable commercial trademark that earns licensing fees for the college. That would be another criterion, this one generated from the second perspective that we would apply. The greatest mascot must also participate in charitable and community events at schools and hospitals. And you can generate, of course, much more than three. I've used three here as an example, one each for each of the perspectives. But from uh, any of the perspectives, you might generate two or three or four different criteria. So the, again, the key thing is to avoid that circular argument. After you define the terms of the argument in section one, that is including defining what the value object is, sections two and sections three on perspective and criteria should actually make no mention at all of the particular value object you have chosen because you're only interested in justifying, explaining, and rationalizing the selection of sensible perspectives and reasonable criteria for making the sort of judgment that you're about to make. So again, if we go back to the example of the greatest basketball player, right? We might say at the beginning, the greatest basketball player was Bill Russell, uh, formerly of the Boston Celtics. Um, and so what perspectives would you choose in judging the greatest basketball player? Perhaps you would select uh, the perspective of statistics, right? Basketball statistics. Perhaps you would select um, the perspective of team leadership, right? And you would generate from each of those perspectives different criteria, right? So... Um, does the person hold an all-time record in important uh, scoring categories or defensive categories in basketball? Uh, that might be a specific criterion from that first perspective. Or we might say whether or not the person was recognized beyond the sport of basketball as being an important community leader, right? So that would be a criterion generated from that second perspective. But you have to have criteria and perspectives that are not focused just on the value object you've chosen, but which are applicable fairly to any other object in the category. So you choose perspectives and criteria which are useful in judging any member of the category to which your value object belongs. And as a test of the fairness of your perspectives and criteria, See if you can make a reasonable case in favor of a different value object in the same category. So if you think the greatest comedy film of all time is Animal House, right, you can construct your argument. But to be sure that you're avoiding a circular argument, take those same perspectives and same criteria and now apply them to some other great comedy film, maybe Blazing Saddles or another one, right? Which, and, and then if, if you're running into instances where the criteria seem not to be able to be applied at all, that may be an indication that you've selected criteria which only can apply to your value object. And so consequently, you may be engaging in a circular argument. So test the fairness by taking the same perspectives and criteria and apply them to some other basketball player or some other novel or some other restaurant or some other museum or some other college mascot, right? Because we wanna have our perspectives and criteria useful for judging any mascot in the category of college mascots, including, for instance, our own mascots Wild E Cat and Gnarls. So then we get to the application section. And in the application section, in the final section, you're addressing that fourth stock issue by turning your specific, turning to your specific value object and now applying the criteria 
you have just defended and rationalized in Section 3. So you've made the argument that there are sensible perspectives for making this judgment, and you've identified sensible and reasonable criteria which, to which, um, which should be applied to any object in the category, and now you're doing that application. That is, you're applying the criteria to the value object you have uh, chosen. So here's where your research comes in, because in doing the research, you've gathered all the evidence to show why your particular value object is the best in the category, right? Or why it is the, um, the superlative, whatever, it's the best, the worst, the beautiful, most beautiful, right? But you've got the evidence for that, and the evidence shows how your value object meets or exceeds the reasonable criteria that you have articulated. So in this section especially, maybe also a bit in the definition section, you'll need to be using footnotes to cite the sources of the evidence in support of your value argument. So you must address each of the criteria that you advanced in the previous section, right? And to do that in the same order. So if you had nine criteria generated maybe from three different perspectives, then, then in your application section, you take the same nine criteria in the same order and you apply each of those criteria to the value object you have selected. So we'll do that in the case of our example of Bucky Badger. So we talked about the perspectives and the criteria. In this case, now I'm applying those criteria to my value object. And I say Bucky is the representative of a very successful athletic program at a Big Ten university. The University of Wisconsin Badgers have won numerous national championships in both men's and women's sports, some of my evidence. The football team regularly appears in major bowl games and on television, such as, for instance, the Rose Bowl in uh, 2020 on January 1st, right? Uh, sadly, they lost to Oregon, but just the same evidence of a successful athletic program. And then I think of my second perspective and the criteria related to the commercial or economic perspective, right? Bucky earns approximately $3.4 million a year in licensing fees with products from cheese to insurance companies labeled with the Bucky Badger brand, right? And again, you would cite evidence, maybe the business section of a newspaper or maybe an official report from the university or something. But the evidence in support of your claim that your value object meets or exceeds the particular criteria that you've identified. We might also point out that Bucky routinely appears at fundraisers for childhood disease research and annually promotes reading in Madison grade schools with personal appearances, right? And again, citing the evidence for this, you know, it might be a newspaper story, it might be um, you know, imagery from the university Facebook page or something where Bucky is at a, a, a local charity event. But in any case, you're citing evidence to show that the claim you're making about your value object meeting those criteria is sensible and reasonable to your audience. You want to prove to them that your value object meets or exceeds the criteria. So that wraps up the uh, discussion of the value argument brief. And if you have any questions on the assignment, I would refer you to the written assignment instructions or you can post questions on the discussion board.